Well, good morning. I'm Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer for the Library of Congress Oral History Project here at our public library of Cincinnati, which does such a wonderful job uh, uh, taking the oral histories of our veterans. And today we have the pleasure and honor to talk to Alex Futcher, uh, who uh, served in Korea. And uh, Alex, uh, as you said, you followed up your brother here who served in the ETO, but uh, were you, where, where were you born? I was born in uh, Campbell County, Kentucky, yeah. probably Dayton High School, uh, Spears Hospital in Dayton, Kentucky. I'll be darned. Now, how much younger are you than the man? Uh, I'm, uh, right now I'm 79 years, 86, I'm seven years. Seven, Seven years, years younger. younger than okay, and so you were out of that wonderful family of brothers and sisters, and uh, was six and of us. Yeah, <laughs> I should say that that's uh, that's just four brothers all were in the service. How there about four that? Of us, all four of us were in the service. How about that? Are there are there any of other brothers uh, still with you? Uh, my brother Maynard is the only brother I have. Two brothers, two brothers left. are gone. Yes, you I two know. are the one brothers left. Well. So you were born in a hospital in yes, Campbell I was. County. I do believe. I don't remember, but they was telling me this. <laughs> and uh, where where did you start out in school? I went to St. Joseph School in Same uh, as the Camp Springs, Kentucky. Right. Mm -hmm. How about that? Yeah. Right. And uh, did you, you went all through? Uh, what was that? A Eighth grade, element, went, el elementary school. Went through the eighth grade of parochial school, yeah. Yes. St. Joseph Catholic School, okay. yes. Okay. And from there I went to, uh, I went, I was the only one out of six in our family that went to high school. I went to Campbell County High School in okay. Alexandria, okay. Kentucky. Yeah, the Camels. Camel, you got it. <laughs> right, golly. I graduated in 1949. <clears throat> 1949. Well, isn't that something? Uh, what, what, uh, did you have hobbies and did you do sports or uh, how about your high school? I played a lot of baseball. Did you? And, Great. Uh, I really didn't know too much about we played a little basketball at home around the boys. Mm -hmm. That's about the extent of our sports so, <clears throat> until I got later on. I love, I love sports today though. Oh gosh, <laughs> yes, I should I say. Well now as, as you were progressing through high school, uh, let's see, you graduated in 49, so you started in 45. Um, what, uh, I mean, you have some recollection of World War II. Oh, definitely. I remember Pearl Harbor Day. You do? I do remember that uh, the neighbor was uh, erecting a, a house, a new house next to our farm. And uh, I just uh, remember Someone came out and says uh, they bombed Pearl Harbor. Somebody was the word Pearl Harbor. Right. And uh, in fact, it was my dad and uh, a couple of friends of his was actually pouring the foundation for the house next door to How our farm. How about that? Yeah. I do remember that very well. Yeah, that was a Sunday. And that was we uh, listened to the radio and uh, sure. I think Franklin Delano he made the decision that we were going to declare war. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I do remember that quite yeah. well. Yes, well, that, that is in most people's uh, memories who lived at that time, uh, an outstanding, an outstanding uh, event. Mm -hmm. um, so then as you went on through high school, uh, you got out in 49, what, what did you do then? I uh, got a job at a local dairy in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, Jersey mm -hmm. Farm Dairy. Mm -hmm. And I worked there until I was uh, inducted into the service in 1951, October of 1951. By that time, the, the so-called Korean War had started. And, yes, uh, there had been a draft for several months. Yeah, there had been a draft. And, several uh, months. And so you were, um, uh, you were uh, lined up to go into the Army. Right, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And where did they send you first? I've got my, uh, what they call it, the, uh, the papers, anyhow, yeah. they call it, whatever your, it was, anyhow. Your was orders. <laughs> yep, uh, to report for uh, induction, you know. 
I was uh, examined in Newport, Kentucky in the old post office building at 8th and Saratoga. I'll be there. Third floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Well, a lot of people you know in that part, uh, uh, part of the state uh, went, went right into, into Fort Thomas, too. Uh, but you Fort, were. Yeah, they probably did, but uh, Fort Thomas was pretty well uh, stabilized as a, uh, 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 ten, what was it, a, a rehab, rehab unit then for the Veterans Administration. Oh, I see, yes, I see. Yes, it was. I got you. All right. Well, now here you are, and uh, you're 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 off to the army. And where did you go? Well, I never will forget it. We uh, had to come over to uh, Fifth and Walnut, about eleven stories high, where we inducted. We took one step forward. You know what that yeah, is, don't right. you? <laughs> one step forward. Raise your right <laughs> hand. <laughs> yes. And uh, we were inducted, and they took us over to the Union Terminal, put us on a train, took wow. us out to uh, Camp Mead or Fort Mead, Maryland. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. We were processed there. Big place. Yeah, we spent about oh maybe four or five days there, getting our clothing and getting all this stuff and mm -hmm. duffel bags and things, and they. Uh, <clears throat> Sent me right back through Cincinnati, and we went to uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. And I was in, uh, I took heavy weapons training at oh, Fort nice. Riley, Kansas. Okay. It was more of heavy weapons, a 4.2 mortar, mm -hmm. 75 recordless, 50 caliber machine gun. Mm. Was, uh, my MOS was uh, um, 4812. That was my. MOS, you're familiar with MOS, aren't you? Military Operating Signal or what it was. That's where we went right. by. Mm -hmm. So I was very familiar with heavy weapons, which I was I very proud of. And I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, uh, that took some uh, really intensive training and, mm -hmm, and very, uh, very technical and all that sort of thing. Very, very site-wise. I mean, the, the oh, sites you was bet. really uh, very technical. You bet. It would take me an hour or two to tell you what a site on a 4.2 motor is. <laughs> I'll take your word for All it. All right, we got you. Oh, well, that, that, uh, that, that's uh, tremendously interesting because uh, Fort Riley, of course, was a very famous post, and mm -hmm. uh, certainly uh, uh, so many men went, went through that. Uh, how long were you there at Riley? I was in uh, Fort Riley about, oh, about Five, five and a half months, something like that. <clears throat> I, I, I had a bad set of teeth when I went in, so they pulled all my teeth and gave me two sets of teeth. Oh my goodness sakes. <laughs> I didn't, couldn't afford too much of them in those days, you know, <laughs> but the Army says, uh, I had mentioned something, uh, hey, uh, I, I shouldn't get drafted, you know. He says, he told me, that you're not gonna bite him, you're gonna shoot these guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's great. <laughs> Okay, so now, uh, now when when you finished at Fort Riley, uh, you were a PFC. No, I was a private. 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 Private hadn't for made, a long time. Hadn't made first class yet. Mm -mm, yeah. No, I didn't know that yeah. basic training. Right, right. I was and, a cadreman out there. After I was waiting for my teeth, I was a cadreman and I was instructing some other recruits. I see. I see. And then from there, where were you sent? Well, I got one out of. From there out there, really, uh, my orders came down. It was for FECOM. FECOM is Far East Command. Mm. That was Japan, Korea, mm -hmm. so forth like that. Well, they gave me about 10 days. I came home and <clears throat> I flew out to uh, Seattle, Washington. I had a report to Fort Lawton Fort in Lawton. Seattle. And uh, stayed, we stayed there another four or five days. And per later, periodically, we shipped out from Pier 91 down in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And uh, we spent several days on the water. And uh, we landed in Yokohama, Japan. And that was a, a very uh, sick situation. Uh, OK. Quite an experience from Pier 91 to Yokohama, a lot of seasick <laughs> people. <laughs> Oh, God, John. Uh, it would take me quite a while to tell you what uh, the experiences there, but it was very different, believe me. <laughs> so. I should say. I know all, 
you know, all those all those soldiers who were been landlocked, you know, never been on the never ocean. Never been away from home, mostly Never before. been away from uh, home. Country boys, farm boys. You know. <laughs> oh, my goodness yes, sakes. How long did it take you to get across? Uh, going over took us about nine, then ten days. Ten days. It was a very small ship. Uh-huh. But uh, we got over there in ten days when I arrived in Yokohama. I, uh, we had a big formation at Camp Drake, and several people were sent to Korea but I was rather felt fortunate that I was sent up to northern Japan to Camp Sendai. For uh, I found out later we were we went up there for amphibious training. Was that, that on Hokkaido? It's up near Shimmelfinning, uh, way okay. up in Sendai, near the way up north. Way north, yeah. Near the right, you can almost see the Russian border. They told oh, us yeah. I don't know right. to see them, but. Uh, All right. Anyhow, I took amphibious training, and that was very sickening out on them boats out there, and Lord, D, it was terrible. But from there, we spent about oh, six weeks or maybe two months up there. And then, uh, actually, if you recall, there were some of the hills in Korea, Jane Russell. <laughs> it, was a it was a terrible battle there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the seventh division, I think, was on. We had the twenty-fourth, who was on that division. Anyhow, they've lost a terrible bunch of uh, fatalities. Yeah. yeah. So right now, in thirty-six hours, we got the call. In thirty-six hours, we were on the ship headed really? to Incheon, Korea. Boy. So we landed in Incheon in about thirty-six hours. I guess about got off the boat about uh, twelve o'clock that night, and we had a big formation. Mm -hmm. about three or four thousand of us on the boat and a big formation and the, <clears throat> the uh, commander whoever's on the microphone says anyone here who has an MOS other than 1745 is now a 1745 1745 Light infantry rifleman. Oh my goodness! Oh. For my 4812, my MOS from from Fort Riley was down the drain. I was uh, usually set back in the rear echelon firing these big mortars and these 75 recordless. So I was a rifleman. <laughs> Good heavens! They didn't even ask you about your. Well, no, training. you were just automatically transferred. You're it. You're you were in it. line, yes, and sir. you were the next guy to go. Oh my God! So there was about three thousand of us, and you know we were sent to different divisions over there. Then yeah. I was sent to APO Seven, Army Post Office Seventh Division. What what uh, what time of the year was it that you went across and then got up to northern Japan? Uh, I guess it was in um, uh, summertime or. September or October. Oh, beginning to get cold. When I was beginning to get cold. It was very bad, too. It was a very cold, cold oh, winter I'll there, bet. believe me. I'll it was. Bet. I'll bet. Yes, it was. I do remember that they took, put us on, got off the ship and put us on deuce and a half trucks. And well, we went on up, saw a sign that said the 38th parallel. What the hell was 38th parallel? We never heard of that before. But we went about three or four mile beyond the 38th parallel, and they took us off of trucks. We had our rifles, we had a basic load of ammunition and a belt and everything like that, mm -hmm. eight clips. And uh, we uh, had a hike for about two miles on up to the positions. I do remember seeing the big sign on the right, you had keep at least uh, 15 foot intervals or 25 foot intervals because Joe Chink directs traffic from here. Yeah, Joe Chink. Yeah, that was Joe Chink. <laughs> wow. So we had a we had a march with our full field pack. That's spooky. On up to the to the line then, and uh, we went to uh, landed well, not upon. Uh, we faced Papas on Hill 1062, hmm. and I was ever so shocked in all my life. All these rounds going off, going up there, way in the distance. We never knew what what was happening, you know. But uh, we got up there at maybe at dusk, and we got, well, I didn't ever see such a thing, it was, uh, this is your bunker. <laughs> it was about an eight by eight. Had about four uh, bunks in there. They were in too many bunks. They were metal rods mm -hmm. and tied with combo wire for a mattress. 
and uh, all sandbags. The sandbags are maybe on top of about uh, eight or ten rows or layers of sandbags on the top. Hmm. And uh, that was our home for wow. 17 months. Right Did there. you have any heat in there? Oh no, there was no heat at all. Huh? No heat. We provide our own heat. Yeah. That was, uh, it was very cold, very oh, cold. Oh my goodness sakes. Yes, I should say. But if I can tell you, sir, uh, I, we got in Korea in a, in a very different time, and more towards the end of the Korean War. I really admire the people was before us, um, Frozen Chosen, things like that in yes. 50 and 51. They went through a lot more yeah. than what we did. We were, f we were uh, called the Main Line of Resistance, the mm -hmm. MLR. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to defend that. We got there, we had positions, we had trenches dug maybe about eight foot deep and about four foot wide. And all in the go so far and then go like this because of, if we ever got captured in one line, it wouldn't take everybody out. You know? Sure. Be this or that. Right. And we had positions like uh, we have, every rifleman had a position at 30 caliber, had a position over here. And uh, uh, like I say, we had to defend that line, the main line of resistance. Periodically, if uh, somewhere we hear somebody out in the front, they would call, uh, get in your position for the FPL, hmm. the final protective line. I mean, uh, a rifleman had to shoot this way, another rifleman had to shoot this way, a 30 caliber shot this way, a 50 caliber shot this way, hmm. or no one would get through that, uh, that line, you know. And usually, um, uh, that when the heat was on, like there was some action going on out in the front, we had to stay awake at night 100%. No wonder the well, you, yeah. you, you had to be in your position for all night long. You could not relax. You could not leave. No, you had to stay there. No smoking, no nothing or nothing. Terrible. You that's the last thing you wanted a cigarette because that was a target. You know? Oh, sure. But, uh, but that, otherwise, when the heat was off, we were 50 percent, 50 percent. Half the guys stayed mm -hmm. on maybe from mm -hmm. eight o'clock, six o'clock at night, maybe till midnight. Then we relieved them, and then we was on 12 to six right. in the morning. I was 50 percent alert. Goodness sakes! Well, that's uh, that's what uh, I've read about about Korea. I was not there, of course, but mm -hmm. what I read about it was that. You could up there on the lines against the chinks. You could not relax for a second. No, never. No, uh, you never take advantage of it. Was going to happen. But we used to, what we did there. We had to defend the line, and, and nearly every night, uh, one of their squads or one of the platoons would would run a patrol on out, way out into the line. There was about three patrols. There was a reconnaissance patrol, info patrol, and a mm. contact patrol. Usually, whatever sergeant, if you had a gung ho sergeant, you'd go all the way. You know, some way. guy'd say, "Hey, yeah. we came back, we didn't find anything." You know. Yeah. But usually, the contact, the contact patrol was to go out and get an enemy prisoner and bring him back. So there were interrogations. You know, we sure. bring him to the rear, and intelligence would uh, interview him. You know, I do remember once I was in the rear when they interviewed a, one of these guys who's. When the chinks, he was strapped down on a stretcher, and uh, he probably had nothing to eat for ages or something like that. And so one guy, one of our intelligence guys, would take a cigarette and blow it right across his nose. Oh, that oh. When they'd say, "Come on, come on, say something, say something, say something," if he didn't say something, they'd get some gohong. You know what gohong was? Gohong was fish heads and rice. That smell, whenever they cooked that, you'd smell that for about a half a mile. Oh, you know. And that was a big meal with the chinks ate. Ooh. So they'd get some gohong, you know, and put that aroma across him. Come on, say something. Mm -hmm. And if he didn't say anything, then they had a real sharp bayonet that would shine up like this, and they'd just bring that line right across uh -huh. that bayonet right under his chin here, you know. And by that time, he'd squeal, he'd squeal everything he got, you know. <laughs> but we were talking about before, we were talking about the Geneva Convention. If we yes. were ever captured, uh, we always had to carry the Geneva Convention card with us. If we were captured legally, all they were supposed we were supposed to offer that card, and all they were supposed to do was 
Uh, we could produce our name, rank, and serial number. That's right. all we had to produce. But uh, there was different tactics, as I can tell oh, you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sure there were. But there was, uh, that's mainly the bit, but we were on, I was on Porkchop Hill and was on uh, Baldy, and way out in the bit was, was T-Bone Finger. Mm -hmm. So that, that was about, maybe maybe about two or three football fields from the main line. But there was about one company, about maybe about oh, 80, 80 of us troops out there. And usually we had to go out to a listening post way in towards the line, way in, in beyond the concertina, mm. beyond in towards the Chinese and listen. And if we ever heard anything, we just held off as much as we could firing this way. And then we got back to our line and uh, we radioed in, you know, then they sent a lot of fire in, you know, there was, they was right. coming in it was to attack us. So that was T-Bone Hill. Hmm. And that was, uh, that was quite an experience too. How, how about your, how about your, uh, your uh, clothing, your uniforms? Did you have oh, adequate? Oh, it was cold, yeah. We had, uh, adequate? we had thermal, later on after we got there, we had thermal boots. We had thermal mittens. There wasn't no thumb. There was just a trigger finger in the right. mitten. But uh, we'd sit on this uh, listening post. You wasn't allowed to move out there. And uh, your fingers would sweat. Water would get down and freeze on the ends down in yeah. here like this. Oh, goodness. And on a listening post, we all formed an a, a, a area of an area sort of comfort, you know, mm -hmm. all the way out like this. And we had a wire. You couldn't talk. We had a wire. Everyone had that wire. Grab all that wire. You know where we knew where everybody was. We come times leave about three three chunks. We get the hell back. You know. Yeah. But that was uh, amazing too. And I did want to mention when we got over there, we did not have any flak vests. You understand what a flak vest mm -hmm. is? Mm -hmm. First of all, they came out with a flak vest. I guess it must have weighed. It felt like it weighed twenty pounds. That was something fairly new, wasn't it? It was a flak. It was actually flak. It was, it was this, uh, material. It was some hard surface, something like asbestos or whatever it was. Maybe about four or five layers. It overlapped, started mm -hmm. here, and overlapped and went all the way down to here. And uh, once it was issued, you would never get out of the bunker unless you had that flak vest on right. because it, it was a protection. You know, you, what was your protection, you know? But later on, near the end, they took those away from us and gave us the real modern, the, with the uh, mm. nylon, you know, that all fit in like our policemen wear today. You know, they have a flak vest, you know. Mm -hmm. But they were, oh, about 80% lighter than the, oh, that what, helps. These, <laughs> what these things were. Gosh, because you, when you were carrying a full field pack, how, how heavy was that? Oh, I guess it weighed about 40 pounds, something like it. 40 pounds. But you had on, it was like the, uh, the old Papasans over there, you know, they had A-frames. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they could carry a Jeep motor on that A-frame. No kidding. <laughs> yep. There's yeah. people talk about that already, that uh, some of these Papasans broke into the motor pool and stole a Jeep motor and they caught them walking down the way. But uh, <laughs> that was something else too. <laughs> But I was talking about, about food and things like that. Uh, you remember the, uh, this was United Nations, yeah. Korea. We had the Colombians attached to us and they were rather different. We didn't understand them anyhow, you know, but uh, occasionally we get different positions where we had to maybe spend a day or two with them, we had to eat with them. So today I never eat any cereal anymore because it usually it, in the morning we cut about a kilo which used to put out about, about a 10 pack. It wouldn't be a Rice Krispies and everything like this, you know. Yeah. They'd come around throwing them one at you. <laughs> and we had powdered milk. It wasn't no creamers, oh, it was powdered yeah, milk. Oh powdered here. milk. Powdered so eggs. So we, we ate with the Colombians. So, so we good, we had our mess gear and our spoon hanging on the side here, you know. and. Uh, they take all these 12 packs and dump them all in one big crock. Oh, gee. <laughs> so, put some milk in there like this. You know, we wouldn't buy their mess gear like that. They'd reach in there. Oh. And you'd have Rice Krispies be hanging on the side of it and 
mud and all this cornflakes and that oh, was terrible. Since then, I haven't eaten a cereal since then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. And with the combination of they're speaking, you know, oh, yeah, Spanish never, and uh, no, we didn't we didn't know speaking English. <laughs> oh, gosh. But I can relate a little bit farther and um, as later on in. Uh, are we interested in some combat stories here? <laughs> sure, absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, it got to be, um, we were get familiar, we'd get the stars and stripes periodically. Well, we get to the rear periodic, about every, uh, maybe about every three weeks, we have, there were three regiments in the 7th Division, the mm -hmm. 17th, the 31st, and the 32nd. Well, I can tell you another thing. I was on a listening post one, one night, and all I had was a C, CB or radio sound power. It was a sound power, was just a wire run all the way back to the command post. Mm -hmm. So I was alert. Oh, I thought, what is going on? I heard a bunch of cans rattling in front of me. I said, I hear some action in the front of me, you know. So lo and behold, they send it. Someone else down there, sergeant came, the platoon sergeant came down and said, yeah, I hear it too. So we put everybody on the alert. They run a patrol out in the front. They put another regiment in the rear, in the rear, in the rear on the alert. Mm -hmm. We were getting attacked because I heard some rattling. Later on, came back. All these guys threw them sea ration cans over the line out there above the other concertina. Mm -hmm. Bunch of rats out there rattling them cans out there. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> so guess who come down to see me? <laughs> the chaplain. <laughs> a major came down all dressed up and says, Son, how's everything with you back home? How's your girlfriend? And you try to comb me down a little bit. You know, <laughs> I was really I was scared <laughs> as hell. <laughs> well, then you got to be, we did get some information about the uh, uh, Pam Moon John. Talks, peace talks going on in Pan Moon Yacht. So called. <laughs> so we'd uh, get the Stars and Stripes, and Ike was running against Truman then. Mm -hmm. Headlines on there Ike says, My mothers vote for me, and I'll bring your sons home. Everybody wrote home, vote for, vote for Ike. <laughs> get the <laughs> hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it uh, got to be about sometime in um, May, I guess. And uh, I guess the chinks thought the talks were going well in uh, Pan Moon John. So lo and behold, one night, it was after dusk, man flares started going up, our flares went up like that, and here we were being attacked. Hmm. They threw everything at us they had for the kitchen sink, all their artillery and everything came in. We dug cover and we started firing like hell. And, uh, Make a long story short, we was on pork chop, and these uh, these guys came broke through our concertina wires, and whistle. Some of them had helmets on, some of them just had boots on. We'd knock one or two of them out, but some another guy'd pick a gun up out here, and he'd start firing that burp gun. So, uh, got later on in the night, we finally lost the hill. Hmm. So, uh, I was then I was. Uh, in a different outfit at then. I was in a Pioneer and Ammunition Platoon. We were tearing ammunition up the hill, bringing litters back down, the wounded back down the hill, and stretchers, putting them on hmm. carts or jeeps, and they'd go to the rear. And um, lo and behold, uh, it got to be about, I guess, maybe midnight or something like that. We'd, we'd try to go back up when another company, another platoon would try to go up and take the hill back, and we didn't do it. So finally, uh, we were near the uh, command post, and we heard our company commander call flash pork chop. And that was a signal for airbursts to go off. And this guy, the artillery, oh, wow. the artillery and the mortars, uh, had to, they had the uh, range set where there were all this explosive went off in the air. Well, flash pork chop. Immediately, four flares went up from the artillery. From the, every four flares went up. That was a signal to take cover. 
Well, me and another guy, we were coming down the hill with one of the other, other ammunition of litters. So we said, I said, uh, Kubik, where in the hell are we going? There wasn't no place for us to go. So uh, what we did, uh, we hid under a deuce and a half. Mm -hmm. For about 30 minutes, some damn things were flying all around. There was stuff flying all over creation, you know. You could see them sparking on the ground. So after about 30 minutes, you know, there's a couple more flares went up. That was meant to cease fires over, you know. I mean, uh, not cease fire, but the uh, uh, air bursts were over. Mm -hmm. Flash pork chop was over. So we got out, and lo and behold, we looked at that deuce and a half, and what was on it was 81 millimeter mortar rounds. Oh, wow. So I think somebody wasn't looking after us guys. Oh, my goodness. If one of them little shrapnel would have hit one of them flakes on that thing there to be a crater in there as big as this building, probably, I presume. My goodness. So there was really a lot uh, going for us, you know, and, and it was really another thing that happened to me that we were relieved. I was a BAR man in Korea, and that drew a lot of fire, too, because mm -hmm. that fired a lot around. That's Browning Automatic Rifle. Browning Automatic Rifle. So about uh, three weeks before all this happened, we were relieved. They put another couple. You, you've been that foot. You had that long enough. They call me Foot in Korea. Mm -hmm. You've had that long enough to give it to somebody else. I never will forget these guys. Both of them guys, their name was Marsh and Mattoon. <laughs> both of them from West by God, Virginia. <laughs> Lo and behold, they were at the foot of Baldy, and both of them got a direct hit. So. Somebody looked out for me then also, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was at the uh, uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, Korean War, when my wife and I, we went up to Washington, D.C., and I, uh, they don't have no walls or anything like that, but they did have a computer tent, and I asked them to type those guys' names in here. Their, hmm. their picture popped up in there. Marshall no too. kidding. Yeah, so that was, so that was pretty much of, uh, well, then I was on pork chop at the ceasefire. Well now, you know, you keep referring to pork chop, and of course that name uh, is uh, pretty well embedded in people's memory who lived at that time. Uh, was pork chop a particularly important uh, position? Definitely. Old Baldy was the highest point in this part of Korea. Okay. Everybody wanted the highest point for sure. observation. Sure, a little bit. Well, we lost Old Baldy. The Colombians were on that thing, and they all weren't as alert as we were. Mm -hmm. Chinks walked in, took it over. Immediately after we lost it, our, it must have been the Eighth Army thought it was too much problems trying to get it back. They had airstrikes. They had planes came in with dynamite. They had ships come in with high explosives, and they blew it up. There was no place you could even make a bunker on that hill. Mm. It was all pulverized. So the next highest point was Pork Chop Hill. I see. That was, uh, people wanted observation. I mean, they wanted the observation, we had the observation. Sure. So that was, uh, uh, that was really uh, uh, the focal point, mm -hmm. you know, the observation mm -hmm. bit there. But come to see SAR, uh, we were told whenever uh, so many rounds went off or something like that, no more fire. Well, lo and behold, we was uh, well. We had a valley. They call it Tong Valley. It was a Death Valley, what we called it. What the Chinese called it, Tong Valley. It was all mined out there. Was so damn many mines out there, oh. bouncing betties and stuff. We got in there, like got a bouncing betty. You 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 lost your leg, sure. you know. But immediately after the ceasefire, the Chinese we noticed there was some time or another way we got a direct fire from over that bit over there. And uh, usually a, a mortar round and artillery has got a trajectory up like this, you know, mm -hmm. the trajectory. But a direct fire like our 75 recordless comes right straight at you, you know. We couldn't figure out our, our FOs, our forward observers, could never find out where in the hell these were coming from. Mm. So the cease fire, what did the chinks do? They unveiled some camouflage on this hill over there. They undermined this mountain little guys did with their hands. You could drive a deuce and a half under that mountain. 
and they had the 75 recoilers pointing right at us, just whatever recoilers it was, wow. that direct fire was right at it. And they made a bunch of damn fools out of us by unveiling that thing that day. They say, here it is. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, then it came to the uh, 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 withdrawal. And I don't know if you understood, or I didn't know they were there then, or the grid lines, universal grid lines somewhere another on the globe. Mm -hmm. I think we had to pull back one hill to the Wisconsin line, to we we left the uh, whatever line we were on, another state line, mm -hmm. uh, we had to pull back to the Wisconsin line and dig in again. Mm. And that was uh, when I was rotated. Uh, I was on line for, when we were on line for four months, or for a month, you get four points. And 36 points was rotation. Nine months, you rotated back out of Korea and came home. So I was, uh, July would have been my ninth month. So I thought, well, July 1st, July 1st of uh, August, I'm out of here. The ceasefire was either the 23rd or the 27th. I only got three points for that month. Oh, for heaven's sake. I had to wait another month to get my 36 points. I had to wait the whole month of August. August to get rotated. So that was a big deal, the big rotation bit. I have a folder over there if you'd like to look <laughs> at it sometime. At, um, our rotation coming back from the front line on Deuce and a Half and coming through the middle of Seoul. I have a picture there of an old streetcar running right down through the middle of Seoul. Women mm -hmm. carrying packages on their head, and Papa Sons mm -hmm. carrying the A-frames. Oh, my. Well, you know, um, Alex, we who were, uh, and, and of course, this came on after you, after the war was over and everything, but there was that television program, MASH. MASH. You know, yeah. and uh, I've often wondered, and I've spoken just to a very few fellows who served at that time over there, if that was realistic or, or just, a, just a comedy. I'd say about 65% of it. You never did see any action. Right. Everything was brought back to the... Battalion aid station. That was the first station. It was a battalion aid station where they bandies. They put tourniquets on people. Yes. And they put them. They took first them back. Aid. And took them back and maybe another two miles back there and put them in a helicopter. Right. And took them back to Incheon. Yeah. There was two hospital ships. The Hope and uh, Health or something like that. Mm -hmm. Hospital ships in Incheon, mm -hmm. where they they flew these helicopters oh, back and took care of them from there. And from there, they took them to Walter Reed or something like that, whatever right. serious they were. But there were two hospital ships in Incheon. Right. So how long were you up there on, in the pork chop area? Uh, we were, I guess, about five months. Five we went to months? The Kum, we were in the Kumwa area, which was another part of Korea. Yeah. And we went in reserve for about three weeks, and they moved us on Deuce and Ash over to the other end of Korea on the Goodness pork sake. chop and the Baldy area. So uh, it was uh, it was quite interesting. Believe me, I well I wouldn't take a dime for what I saw, and I don't uh, want another dollar for it. <laughs> I know, you know, people ask you about well, how did you really feel about it? You know, well, at the time you were concerned with self-preservation, you know, and, definitely, I and, had, and your buddies. Right. And, I uh, had, when I rotated, I had a real nice burp gun I was going to bring home with me. So I got back to the rear and. At that time, there was nothing in Seoul more than about three or four big Quonset huts. You know what a Quonset huts were? These big metal buildings. You sure. Know? That was the middle of Seoul. That was the only thing in Seoul then. And they told us, uh, hey, you fellas got any souvenirs you want to take home with you? Just bring them on down here and uh, we'll write your name down. You get a 30-day extension over here. Mm -hmm. So what did I do? I threw that damn thing under my bunk. I wasn't going to stay over there any longer. <laughs> no. <laughs> Did so you get got, that gun home? Please? Did you get that gun no, home? No, I didn't. No way at all. <laughs> <laughs> no way at all. I didn't, uh, didn't want to do that. No way. Any, any uh, uh, do you recall any humorous or funny experiences of, of uh, while you were over there, people <laughs> and so forth? Well, I was over there. Uh, I can only relate to one thing. I didn't tell you before that what Porkchop Hill that we had had that uh, another uh, 
platoon of our company, we retook that hill that next morning. Oh my gosh. They lost 23 guys yeah. taking it, but we took Report Job Hill again. We did have that at the ceasefire. We did have that. But only my best buddy, in, in, what was his name? Chuck E. Long, Charlie Long. There will for you. Great guy. In fact, we had a bit of, he get knocked out, he get killed, he was going to write to my wife, my girlfriend, sure. and I was going to write to his girlfriend something out there, <laughs> but we both made it. And when we were leaving, <laughs> we were so close, we avoided each other, said goodbye. So I went to look for him in Hershey, Pennsylvania later on. There it is. Hmm. <clears throat> it was a great ride coming home, though, believe me. I have pictures of uh, 15 days on the water. I bought a box of cigars. I'm trying to quit smoking. I smoked one cigar while I was on the boat. Mm -hmm. The rest of them came home with me. <laughs> <laughs> so we spent 15 days on the water, and the first thing we saw was a Golden Gate Bridge. Wow. And, uh, what a no, sight. No, we'll forget uh, they sent a ship, a, a big boat out, the big band on it, uh, greeting us here. No kidding. And they had a, one, of the, one of the Hollywood gals out there singing, You Belong to Me. Oh, boy. Remember that song? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. See the pyramids alone and all. I know. Tear your heart apart. <laughs> it was. And we had, uh, on our boat, we had about 75 repatriated prisoners. From up north, you know, they were repatriated. Yes. They put them on our boat with us. They had half the boat, and we had the other half. Hmm. So they, they had the uh, security and uh, ASA and all the, all the intelligence and getting from all the information they get out of them, what was left back up there, where they were of anybody else there. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was one fellow on there got a CMH, a Congressional Medal of Honor. Really? So wow. we hit uh, Pittsburgh, California, uh, where our boat docked there. Marine Adder, I got a picture of it. And uh, they let those guys off first, naturally. So this fell, there was five generals in line waiting to salute that sea image. Yeah. <laughs> Hell with you. <laughs> Went up to see his family. Oh. <laughs> it was, well, it well, was something else. I should say. But uh, it I was uh, quite an interesting trip, believe me. Did you, did you, uh, did you, uh, we've heard about the fact that there might even be, yeah, even today, some, some of our soldiers that were captured and stayed over there, you know, and did you uh, have any experience with anybody like no that? No way at all. Uh -uh. Yeah. No way at all. Yeah. Well, Alex, my goodness, that, that experience was tremendous. Now, when you got back to Pittsburgh, California, um, <clears throat> You weren't discharged immediately, were you? Oh, that, that is another bit, believe me. All right, let's hear that one. <laughs> I can't tell it was uh, the announcement on the ship. Anyone, uh, let's see, west of the Mississippi get on these ferry boats. Several ferry boats must have held 100 people on them ferry boats. Anybody east of the Mississippi get on the buses. Hmm. Well, I was east of the Mississippi. Sure. These guys got on these uh, ferries. They cut their orders and paid them and everything like that and went up to Cam Stone and give them clothes to go home, Class A uniforms to go no home. No kidding. They got on a plane and went home. They were home the next day or something like sure. that. Sure. Anybody of uh, east of the Mississippi. Had to get on the buses. We had to get on buses. <laughs> <laughs> go up there and get a big steak dinner and a quart of milk. We didn't know what a quart of milk was. A big oh, steak yeah. dinner up there. We had a real we, milk. Yeah, we got a quart of milk. There. We didn't know cup. We just drank a quart of milk. <laughs> yeah. Never had any milk for about a year, you know. So uh, draw bedding. Draw bedding. What the hell we want bedding for? We stopped the sleeping bag for nine months for crap's sake. Yeah. If you don't draw it, you're going to pay for it. Hmm. So uh, well, for that sake. was amazing too. Was, so I got, they put us on a train, five and a half days mm. to Evansville, Indiana. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I never did tell you about my R&R &R, though, after a period of time, you know, yeah. we, was, uh, we was given rest and re relaxation R&R &R five days. 
went back to Seoul. I had a relative in, in Tokyo, so I would put a request in for Tokyo and very seldom ever give it to us mm -hmm. because some of the top brass went Tokyo. So I got to go back to Tokyo, spent five days with my friend. Oh, good. So uh, we left, we got in Seoul and processed and everything, I like got class A clothing and stuff. And uh, we got a message somewhere on radio or somewhere we came in, somewhere came in that a plane cracked over the Sea of Japan, 130 GIs killed a C-124 Globemaster. Oh boy. That was, that was big enough to hold tanks. We sat in them thing in them, them bags and sure. straps, you know, double high. So hell, six hours later, they put us on one too. Mm. Well, we got landed over there in Tokyo, kind of about our business, you know. After there, about eight, five, six days, they said, anybody, it's, uh, we went back to Camp Drake, ready to go back. He says, oh, you're extended day to day. Come back every day. So we got extended five days because of, of that. They saw that was sabotage, mm -hmm. that that plane went down, you know. So how we ran out of money, we didn't have any money. <laughs> so what, the Red Cross we got 25 bucks. That lasted me a long time. There was, yen then was 360 mm -hmm. to a dollar. So uh, we got uh, $25. And believe me, I never did, they never did catch up with me until I got home, if I was home about two months, I got a letter in the mail from the Red Cross. <laughs> That you owe them? Oh, never. You're going to get bad credit. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. So that was about the extent of my trip. <laughs> I was damn glad to get home again. Oh, enough. I should say. Well, your family welcomed you warmly, and oh, my gosh. Oh, they did. It was great. I landed at Cincinnati Airport when they only had uh, no jet jetways at all and no. her terminal one was the only one mm -hmm. and I landed uh, we went to from uh, Henderson Kentucky to uh, Louisville there was about 16 or 18 civilians on there I said can I have this first seat because I want to be the first one off here mm -hmm. <laughs> they let you off first oh I bet the place exploded <laughs> here he is here he is <laughs> oh Amazing, though. Oh my goodness! I should say, well, you you've had uh, you've had a, a tremendous experience, and and it's something, you know. People say, well, would you do it again if you had to? Yes, of course you would. But it uh, is something that stays with you forever, and uh, uh, you know you certainly have. Uh, the opportunity to be proud of what you did. Um, our our people didn't brag much about what they did, you know. No, World we War II, the Korean story, yeah. War, didn't brag. Happy to be back home again. That was the big deal, wasn't it? It was definitely the biggest, biggest deal. Yeah. We never did anything. In fact, I'd, I would get an allotment all the time, a lot, and I'd get 75, 45, 75 dollars a month, 45 dollars for being online. I wrote home, I said, spend that money, I'll never need it, spend it, will you? Yeah. <laughs> of course they did. <laughs> of course not. They saved it for you. <laughs> yeah, they did. I didn't think well, I'd ever make it home, believe <laughs> Well, now, when you, when you got back home, and uh, here you are, an experienced man, and, and you've, uh, you've uh, struggled, and you've had a hard time and everything and so forth, and you've succeeded. Uh, what what did you do when you got back home? You got a job, or I went right back to my old dairy work. Where I oh, started you did. Just, before I left. They kept my job for they me. They kept your job open. And I came me. back, and I was a milkman for several years for Is that dairy so? Court. Yeah. For heaven's sake. <laughs> yeah, they kept my job for me. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's just just wonderful. Well, you've done many things through your life, and of course. Your cap uh, indicates uh, uh, so many fine things. Post, past post commander of the local VFW, and uh, tell, tell, tell us about your... My biggest badge, my biggest thing is my combat infantryman's badge. My brother has that also. Yes. That's, you have to be online for 31 days to get that combat that infantryman's combat badge. That combat right here. That's the one with the big crown on it yep. right there. And this here are my pro pottery. This is our 31st, we were polar bears, our 31st infantry mm -hmm. regiment, polar bears. 
and this was the uh, infantry we blow that up was our brass right there that was, was on your uniform and, and uh, you made corporal these. now here you've got you have this this ribbon here with two bronze stars on it what I was it? not individual bronze stars they were awarded to our battalion I see okay all right I and really this don't, this there's a Korean flag there right, on that. that. Is, I have I no knowledge of, of ribbons. I guess if I would send away to, to my VFW magazine, yeah. I would get all my ribbons. I, I understand there's tons of ribbons I wear, but I know, I'm really yeah. not interested in them. All I want to do is hit that CIB. That's, I'm well, proud of that. Well, I should say so. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the recognition you know, the recognition of the <coughs> Korean War uh, is, is very spotty. True. I mean, you've never gotten, you've never gotten true uh, awards or accolades or bravos or anything like that. They didn't have a parade for you when you came home. No, they didn't. I know. I, I, I didn't get one either the same after, thing, don't you? after World War II. But, uh, the Navy was like that because the Navy was on different ships, you know, and from different times and so forth. But um, do you have an opportunity to speak to groups, uh, school groups and so forth? I have a tape over there that I spoke at my church group Good for on you. Veterans Day. They wanted one from each of the wars and I spoke for about 20 minutes. And Good. I. Uh, told of some of my stories I'm telling you now. Absolutely. I broke down with all of it. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's, it's an emotional thing, and particularly when you think of your buddies that didn't come That's home. That's true, very true. I have a lot of yeah. over there. Yeah, I should but say. President Reagan called this Korean War was the beginning of the Cold, the beginning of the ceasing of the Cold War. Yes. That's what President yeah. Reagan called yeah. it. Yeah. So I guess we can, even though it was a ceasefire, well, I know you certainly, you certainly have all the rights to be very, very proud uh, of your participation in that terrible time. And you know, it was a. I mean, it it, it wasn't even declared an official war. No. Uh, and the United Nations kind of mushed it up, and I, I don't know. That's why it was a police action. Yeah. That's what they call it. Police, police action. action. That was it. That oh. was it. Just imagine. I wasn't, I wasn't no cop. No. I was saying, <laughs> you weren't directing traffic. <laughs> That's for sure. Well. You don't uh, know about the camera. I've got to look at the camera once in a while. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, after your, after your career as a milkman, then, then what happened? Then I'm uh, cool with it. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy, I retired in 1992. Good. And I'm just living a life of ease. Well, that's wonderful. And uh, I lost my wife about four years ago. And, oh, uh, I'm sorry. I really yeah. miss her quite a bit, Oh, too. sure. Tell us about your family. You have children? Or? I have uh, five children. Mm -hmm. uh, four boys and one daughter. And four boys live locally, and I guess who would move away is my daughter moved to Kansas City. I see. And she has two children out there, and he's... Uh, one boy is uh, in Kozik, Kansas, KU in Manhattan, Kansas, mm -hmm. and uh, he is a great pitch, baseball pitcher. Throws 93 miles an hour. Oh my Looking goodness! Looking for him to get in the draft. Are they going to? As he played it, at, I don't know. Did Kansas State play in the uh, NCAA? Uh, yeah, in the they College World out. Series or anything? No, uh, they got beat out, and uh, it was in Arkansas. Okay. And uh, they got they got beat out in that bit. Yeah, so they're, they're back home. My, my grandson's got a pitch for. He is he's got to uh, pitch off season too all summer long. He has to pitch. Sure. But draft is coming up this week. Mm -hmm. Possibly, I don't mm -hmm. know if he's eligible yet or not. I think he got two years in college for you mm -hmm. drafted. But he's a very good, excellent baseball player. Well, that's wonderful. He would. Uh, you know that that's that's a a dilemma too, isn't it, for for good athletes? It is. Whether to go on with your schooling or take the money and run. Uh, I 
I have no idea where they were at, believe me. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I was hoping he'd take the money and run because Grandpa needs a new car. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how long did you serve as post commander? Uh, two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. Two years. <clears throat> that was a term, two years as post commander by VFW. We have a very active VFW post in our community. Good. Very Good. active. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's, that's I'm mighty proud of. I've been through it for 55 years. I have a pin up here that says 55. Oh, yeah. How good. about that? <laughs> 55 years. I joined it in 1955 or 50, 55. I joined it. You know, as you think about it and reflect back, uh, what is what? What do you think about the the, pol the world politics, and 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 what's gone on over there since? We've still got two hundred and fifty thousand men on the line over there in terrible, Korea. Terrible, terrible. It's very terrible. Yeah. It's amazing. Just the other day, they sunk a uh, battleship. South Korean battleship. Oh, yeah, a submarine. It was yeah, a submarine. Yeah, a submarine, that what it is? Yeah, went down with 46 men on it. I sure hope we don't go back there again. Those oh. chains will be dug in this time for sure. Oh, yeah. That is for certain. <clears throat> well, North... Excuse me to call it the Chinese chains, but that's what we got yeah, to call well, it. Yeah, well, I know. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I, kind of, I, I remember some guys call, calling the Koreans slant-eyed slopeheads. <laughs> That's a little rough. Because some of works with that, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the Papasans, if you had no. Oh. Right. We had some traders in the Papasans over there. Sometime we were online. I saw one guy one night, a, a Papasan was stretching a wire from our line back over to their line. He oh, my gosh. Squealing what was going on on this oh. side. And one of these guys, one of our buddies, just took a butt of that rifle. And, oh, that's you whacked him, huh? You whacked him. Oh, oh God. my goodness. He never spoke anymore, believe me. Oh, my word. Yeah. Well, the, um, the, 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 the uh, politics of, of it, North Korea, which is so different from South Korea, is Definitely. It? The government and, and the people. I mean, they're a bunch of nutcases up north. I was listening to Larry King the other night, and he interviewed these two reporters, you know, that they captured. Oh, yes. And that was very interesting. Yeah. You know, President Truman, mm -hmm. President Clinton went over and, and released them. They wanted someone in high echelon to go over there. And he went over there and spoke and released those two reporters. Right. That was very interesting on Larry King's show. Yes. Well, with that sort of a situation over there, we have to be constantly vigil vigilant about uh, our relations and so forth. And uh, uh, so many Americans today don't realize that we have all those, we've still got all those troops over there on the, on the south side of the line. I didn't suppose to you tell you how cold it was. It was 40 degrees, 40 degrees below zero. Over 40 there below these, zero? On the on that listening post when we were out there. Oh. And we couldn't move. Yeah. I had to come in that much morning, we came in at dusk, and I had to relieve myself, and I, I, I couldn't unbutton my buttons, I just had to rip, oh, <laughs> rip my yeah. all the buttons just off. frozen. <laughs> to relieve myself, yeah. Sure. It was bad. Uh, it was cold. We heard of, we've heard about some of the soldiers getting trench foot, you know. Frost, frostbite, yeah. And frostbite mm -hmm. and frostbite, so forth. That's true, yeah, yeah. quite a bit of that. Well. Alex, this has been a great honor and a privilege for me to be able to, to speak with you. And of course, uh, as I explained earlier, a copy of this, uh, you'll get a DVD for the family, which is nice, because you can show that to all your friends and so forth. And uh, a copy uh, stays here in the archives of this library and also the Library of Congress in Washington. Is that right? So anybody, I mean, you're, you're public property now. You know, anybody in the world can find out about Alex Futcher <laughs> and, and, oh, I knew that guy. <laughs> I'm going to ring him up. But anyway. Maybe I'll meet my buddies. Yeah, I should say. Well, we thank you so much for giving us your, your time and, uh, you look wonderful, and uh, uh, we just uh, wish you the best.
forever. And there you go. thank you so much I for appreciate the again. Honor of being here, sir. Well, <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thank you. Very good.